Tonight, I'll be talking to you about top six things that scare all Christians. There are, there are six particular nightmares that Christians dread a lot and the most. But this will also include God himself. There is something here that scares the Lord, that terrifies the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, believe it or not. Now, before you call me a blasphemer and a heretic, bear with me as we go through the scriptures, and then you might open your eyes a bit. Now, I would also like to add, it's not just Christians, it's lost people in the world. They can be included in this list, all right? So it may not be all six, but one of these six points is going to hit somebody. And then by the time we reach the end of the six things, it's going to hit everybody. Amen. I guarantee you this will be the most scariest, this will be the most scary video you'll ever watch and see. This, is, this will be the most terrifying lesson. What a crowd tonight. What a perfect time for that. Okay. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Get ready to be terrified. This will be the most scary thing. It'll be greater than ever. Uh, it'll be greater than any horror movie that you'll ever watch. It'll be greater, believe it or not, than any torture or pain that people go through. So this will be a big, shocking video. Proverbs 1. All right, six, and then always to the top one, right? All right, six. Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. You might say, why should I be scared of that one? Why is that so terrifying to me? You better, because if you don't, God has something to say for those of you who don't have this. Well, that ain't scary to me. You should, because God will make sure you do get scared if you don't have the fear of the Lord. That's what he said. Okay, let's look at Proverbs chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 26. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures. I don't think we can go through all of them, so we'll see what we can do. God says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when what? Your fear cometh. So God says and guarantees there's going to time that something you fear and you dread. And look, God's not stupid. He knows your weaknesses. He knows what you're afraid of, even if you don't. And what he's going to do is laugh at you. Why? Verse 27, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. When your time of fear comes, and it could be on this earth or even in eternity, God's going to make sure that you're going to go through that time and you might even call him out. And God says he's not going to answer and he's not going to hear you. Why? Verse 29, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the what? Fear of the Lord. Now look at verse 33. This is more specific about the fear of the Lord. The reason why you should fear him is because, verse 33, but whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from what? Fear of evil. See, basically any evil thing you go through in life, you will go through that. You will face that if you don't receive the fear of the Lord. That's why you should have a fear of God. If you have the fear of the Lord in you, it will prevent you from fear of evil. As a matter of fact, there are so many verses where God says, don't fear man, don't fear pain, don't fear suffering. Why? Because if you have the fear of the Lord... Those things are minuscule to a Christian because God is more fearful. But if you choose the fear of evil out there, okay, rather than the fear of the Lord, God's going to make sure you get that fear of evil then. That's why you should have the fear of the Lord. That's a scary thing. It's a scary thing. The fear of the Lord is extremely scary. If you don't think so, then uh, wait till you go through it. He's going to laugh at you then. And you will know what what really fearing God means then. Now go to Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15. Proverbs chapter 15 and then Proverbs 23. We're going to go to Proverbs 15 and Proverbs 23. Two places. Proverbs 23 and Proverbs 15. Why should you have the fear of the Lord, you might ask? 
you should fear God because the Bible points out at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 16, how much scary the Lord should be compared to other things in life. Without the fear of the Lord, even a little bit of it, you're going to go through great trouble in your life, a lot of problems. You know, people are scared about the current pandemic situation, the financial crisis, about how to take care of their kids and their family. Guys, you ain't seen nothing yet, all right? God's going to give way more trouble during the tribulation time. And God says a little bit of the fear of the Lord is better than that. Wow. Look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 16. The Bible says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than what? Great treasure and trouble therewith. Wow. How about that? Go to Proverbs 23. Your hand's already there. I'm going to read verse 17. 17 reads, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Now that's a good verse. You might envy sinners out there. Oh, the lost world has it better than us Christians. Oh, why can't I live out like them? And no, 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 no. You shouldn't envy them. You should live in the fear of the Lord. Because when you envy them, you're going to follow the same mistakes that they do. And guess what? You're going to go through a lot of pain and hurt. And some of you have experienced that or currently experience that and know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, good, See, it's better to fear God that, hey, don't mess around with that sin. Don't be envious of them. You're just asking for trouble and pain. Yeah. Now go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And then we'll look at verse 31. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. Why should you have the fear of the Lord? Because God knows what you fear more than you do. Any evil situation that you go through out there are just things and objects, and they don't know your fear. But God knows exactly in your heart what you fear, and guess what? He can even bring that what you fear the most upon you to teach you a lesson. Oh, you don't fear me yet, buddy? I'll show you. I'll teach you how to fear me. Look at uh, Hebrews 10.31. Remember, he's the one that reads everybody's minds and hearts. All right? He's the one who created you. He ain't stupid. Hebrews 10.31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. Jonathan Edwards preached a famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And if you read that message, it was actually, believe it or not, that reading was given out in Berkeley class. I couldn't believe it. UC Berkeley, they were giving out his uh, reading material for students to read. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. It's amazing that these people don't have the fear of the Lord after that. Yeah. Jonathan Edwards, that sermon put the fear of God in people. They dr slipped from their pews as if they were dropping into hell, reports go. Isaiah 66, 4. God will give you what you fear the most. Verse 4, I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. Wow. See, God's going to make sure that he'll give you what you fear the most. If you don't fear the Lord, if you mess around with sin. All right, Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12. Go to Luke chapter 12 and we'll read verse 4. Luke chapter 12 and we'll read verse 4. Number five. All right, what's the scary thing here? What will terrify you? Well, number five, which is pretty obvious, is hell. Hell. Now, people talk about, you hear kids nowadays talking about, you know, I'm going to party in hell and stuff like that. You, buddy, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're asking for. Now, Christians are saved from hell, and once you're saved in Jesus Christ, you can't burn in hell, even if you wanted to. However, let's be honest, hell does scare us. It terrifies us. That's why we have a burden to tell other people how to get saved. Hell is so scary, it will make you want to tell somebody how to get saved. And you're scared of witnessing to people? You're not scared of hell enough. All right, I'm going to show you a verse that will prove it. First of all, go to Luke chapter 12, verse 4. Luke 12, verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. Wow, what about that? God says, people who do stuff to your body, 
Think about the worst torture, pain, and yeah. harm in your body. God says, don't fear that. <laughs> What's scarier than that? The next verse, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yeah, I say unto you, fear him. God says hell is far worse than that. Now go to Luke 16. Luke 16. You don't know how frightening hell is. You don't know how much of a nightmare hell is. Look at Luke chapter 16. Like I told you before, it will scare you so bad that you will want other people to be saved and you'll witness to them. You want proof? Look at Luke chapter 16. Look at verse 23. 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Look what this guy did because he's so scared of hell. Look at verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may also testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Wow! This guy who's burning in hell was so scared and terrified that he wanted his family to hear about hell. And you Christians are scared to talk about hell in soul in it, in uh, preaching. Wow, you're not scared of hell. Take, take one hour trip to hell, you're going to come, come back the best missionary in the world. Go to Matthew 8, uh, no, not that one. Go to verse 23 and 24. 23, 24. How scary is hell? In hell he lift up his eyes being in torments, right? Look what he wanted in verse 24. Verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Did you hear what he said? He never said, get me out of hell. He never said, uh, stop the flame. He never said, you know, give me a cup of water. Not even a, 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 a half a cup of water. You know what he said? Just dip the tip of the finger in water. So not even a drop of water. Not even a drop of water. Just dip the tip of the finger in the water and just touch my tongue. Not my whole body. That's how scary hell is. All right, Mark chapter 9, verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. It's better that you never use your hands again, guys. Uh, look at verse 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell. It's better to, you know, where you feel handicapped and crippled, the Bible says, than to burn in hell. Look at uh, the next verse, verse 47. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Imagine that someone took out your eyeball. Would you be willing for them to do that? And God says, yeah, I'd, uh, you should be willing to do that in order to not to burn in hell. That's horrifying. Imagine you don't get to see as well. Not just the pain of removing it, you don't get to see. Okay, let's go to Revelation 1. Revelation 1. If you're lost and you have not received Christ for your salvation, you should be scared today hearing this. Look, we want everyone here to get saved. So if you don't know how to get saved or to go to heaven, or if you're not sure... Let me ask you this. Are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven after you die? If you're not 100% sure, grab any of us here in our church, any of our members, or even me, we'd be happy to get you saved right now. All right? That's a horrible thing. All right. Hey, the worst is yet to come. All right? You came here tonight for this one. All right? The worst is yet to come, if you think that's awful enough. Believe it or not, the fourth thing that is extremely a nightmare is God's presence. Believe it or not, if God were here right now present with you, you wouldn't go, oh, I love you, Jesus. It's so good to see you. I finally get to meet you. No, 
you'd be terrified. Your body can't handle it. Your mind can't handle it. You feel like dying. You know why? Because your weak human flesh, corruptible flesh, he's incorruptible and holy, and you can't stand it, and you prefer to die. That's how... So people talk about in a vision, they see God or talk to God. You don't know what you're talking about. If you really met God, talk to him, you dread all over and you wet your pants. For people that say, oh, I felt warm all over my body, a fuzzy glow, and I just filled with love, I felt good. No, that's the devil. That ain't the Lord. All right? When you meet God and talk to him, when you have a revelation or vision, this is the reaction. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. See, God directly spoke to me. Oh, and you saw him? Look at this. When he looked at that voice, verse 13, 14, 15, 16. That's a description of how God looked. And then you know how he responded at verse 17? And when I saw him, I felt the love of Jesus flowing all over my body and more alive than ever before. No, I fell at his feet as dead. That's right. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. God had to say, fear not. That's scary. That's scary. God is a nightmare, believe it or not. Look at Exodus 20. Oh, God ain't a nightmare. I love him. Okay, let me ask you this. Do you fear the, the lightning? Do you fear lightning? Do you fear an earthquake? Do you fear if there's a... Let, let's put this to the test. If a cataclysmic event happened right now in this building and everything shook up and rocks were falling and lightning got up, let's see you be all calm. I guarantee every one of you panic, go, ah! like that. You act like an idiot after that and you're like, I ain't scared of God. Do you realize a cataclysmic event like that is God's presence itself? And you think that, I'll tell God a thing or two? <laughs> you nuts. All right. Look at, they don't know God. Look at Exodus 20, verse 18. You're learning tonight? <laughs> Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off, and they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. Yeah. They're scared. Now look at, the, uh, look at Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Now, if you look at Exodus 20, Moses said, Fear not, right? So Moses was a brave soul. Actually, no, he was scared too. He had to be brave for them. But he was terrified too. Look at Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. Hebrews 12, 18. Moses is describing the same event at Exodus 20 at Mount Sinai. Verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if it was so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the dart. They couldn't stand it, that they can't touch it. Look at verse 21. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Emoji smile, you know, after that. See, Moses, he was very scared and terrified after that. Some of you didn't catch that, right? Well, you'll kind of catch it if you look at that verse, okay? It was just a, it was a lame joke. All right, go to, go to Ezekiel 1. Go to Ezekiel 1. Go to Ezekiel 1. Go to Ezekiel 1. Every jot and tittle. <laughs> Every jot and tittle. It's like the Lord was saying, oh, uh, yeah, Moses, Moses was scared. Hee <laughs> hee. Ezekiel 1. Uh, now forget what I just said. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 26. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 26. Now look, uh, Ezekiel got a glimpse of God and he couldn't stand it. When he was up there in heaven with God, he couldn't stand it. Look at verse 26. God was just filled with brightness. See that at verse 26? Verse 27, brightness. 
Verse 28, brightness. The idea is this. It's such a terrible brightness, it puts so much fear into you. I don't know if you ever experienced a kind of brightness before, brightness that hurts your body. You think the sun's brightness gets to you and you get freaked out? A room so bright and you're wandering out trying to find your way out? No, this is God himself. Look at the last part of verse 28. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. And you know what God had to do? Verse chapter 2, verse 1. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet. Verse 2. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet. See, he needed God's help. It's so scary. You need God's strength and power to pick yourself up. You might say, why? Because you have no power to do it. Tough guy, you. That's right. You needed God's help. That's how pitiful you are. Look at Revelation 6. You might say, no, I don't fear God and uh, wait till the time comes. You will. One day, you're going to remember what I taught you tonight. And one day, you're going to be saying Revelation 6. And you're going to cry out to be stoned to death. You're going to actually cry out for the mountains to blow up and to fall on you. You'll be thankful to be stoned to death rather than meeting God. You're going to cry that out one day. You don't believe me? Look at Revelation 6, verse 16. Uh, verse 15, what is 15? The kings of the earth, right? These are big shots. Great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men. What did they do? They cowered and whimpered at verse 16 and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. That's how scary God is. You can't even stand the sight of him. Go to 1 Samuel 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5. You know how scary God is? When we come to the last point, it may be it may be that God's presence is so scary, you prefer to burn in hell than being in God's presence. Can you imagine that? We saw how frightful hell is, and you would prefer this one more than this. This is why it's four. It's a little higher. Okay. I think uh, that's one of the most scariest things is that one. But we'll, when we come to number one, you'll get it a little bit more. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 11. All right, number three, what do you fear? God's value. Didn't you know that God's object you will even fear? Yeah, that God is so scary that when he puts a value on a person or a, a piece of object, you're going to be afraid and terrified. That's how scary God is. All he has to do is touch a piece of stone, and then if he wants you to fear that one, then you'll be afraid. You don't believe me? Hey, look at 1 Samuel 5.11. 1 Samuel 5.11. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to his own place, that it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. You know what God did? Wiped out people in cities. Why? Because they had the ark of God with them. They were scared of that ark. They said, no, get that thing away. Can you imagine the ark of God coming and then those Philistines say, no, keep that away from our city. See, they got scared of an object, a box, crying out loud, a box. They were scared of that. Look at 2 Samuel 6. 2 Samuel 6. That's some box. 2 Samuel chapter 6. That's how scary God is. That you will cry out for mommy just seeing a piece of box that he touches. You should be scared. You should have the fear of the Lord. 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 6 through 7. All right, how, how scary is this? Verse 6, and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. He just touched the box. Just touch, a simple touch. Verse 7, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. 
Oh yeah, I dropped them dead. Look at Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24. Didn't you know, not just even an object or a thing, even something that's not physically there. You know that? Even something that's not physically there, an object that's not there, if God puts his hand on some nothing out there, then you'd be terrified. You want to bet? All right. People, they take God's name in vain like it's drinking water. Nothing to fear about. And a name which has no physical object or, or a substance to it, God says, you take my name in vain, you're stoned to death. Look at Leviticus 24, verse 16. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. How so? Not a pretty death, not an easy death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, being stoned to death. That's scary. All right. Go to uh, Re Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Wow, how about that? On, even uh, God don't even have to have a physical object right. for you to fear him. He can just say anything out there and say, fear that. And now we have people nowadays who just uh, have no hesitation, no fear as they take that Bible you have in your hands, the King James Bible, and make, cor and make corrections to it. Add it and subtract to it. <laughs> These people have the audacity to justify their sin of doing that too. Man, they have no fear of God. Look at Revelation 22. You better be afraid. His Bible. Yeah, his Bible. Verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this, uh, the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Whew, that's serious. That's scary. If you mess with this book, God's going to mess with your life. Teach you to fear. Teach you to fear. That's why, no, uh, well, we don't have like a nonchalant attitude when we hold that book. There's like a reverence there. There's like, look, I, some of you even said this, like as when books are being stacked up and then there are some books stacking on top of the Bible, I saw some of you or heard some of you saying, hey, man, I just have an uneasy conscience of doing that. Let's just put the Bible on top of it or somewhere else. Why? There's a fear. There's a fear. Look at Psalms 105. Psalm 105. Psalm 105. Oh, you worship the King James Bible. That's not what I said. Hey, we don't worship the Ark of the Covenant, but if God puts his value on something or somebody, you better treat it right. You better not touch it. You know, there are people online who nonchalantly post nasty or ridiculous comments criticizing preachers. We live in a day and age now. This is bad. I know there's a lot of false prophets out there and false pastors. But man, when God has good men of God and good pastors, you should have some fear yes, and sir. respect. There are people who have no fear. They don't hesitate to start fights in church to talk bad about the pastor and cause church splits. If I were you, I'd fear that. You might say, why should I do that? Wouldn't you fear messing with his book? Wouldn't you fear messing with his name? How can you not fear when he also puts his touch on his man speaking for him? He not only said, don't touch the Ark of the Covenant, he also said, don't touch mine anointed. Who's his anointed? It's not just kings. Look at Psalm 105, verse 15, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and what? Do my prophets no harm. It's the people who preach his words. But here's another thing. I know that there are some people who might use this as a passage for pastoral authority, right? And they might use it to abuse it. Uh, however, the thing is this, is that even though this is at an Old Testament sense, 
and there were people who took the prophets and slayed them and killed them, you got to realize this. One, prophets were preaching God's word, correct? Second thing, they were anointed. Now, what does that mean? When a person anoints a person's head, they get, uh, that's God's Holy Ghost going on them, right? You know who also gets that touching of the head or laying on of hands on the head? Pastor. They're being selected, anointed. See that? How about that? But uh, look at 2 Kings, 2 Kings 2. 2 Kings 2. Now, false prophets, there's no hesitation and you shouldn't fear them. That's what the Bible said. Same thing with false pastors. So I don't uh, hesitate to kick them. But when there are pastors who are used by God, then you better watch out for that one. Look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23. Okay? You don't think it's a serious thing. Look what they did with this one preacher here. 2 Kings 2.23, And he went up from thence unto Bethel and, Bethel, and he was going up by the way. There came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said, said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. And then the preacher just ignored him. <laughs> no. God, everyone laughed. Oh, it's just a joke from kids. No. 24, And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Okay, what's the point? The point is if God puts his hand on something or somebody, yeah, you should fear. Why? Not because of the thing or the person, because of God. Yeah. It shows how much you disrespect God yeah. on what he chooses to use. Amen, brother. People who split churches are rebellious attitude and don't submit under a pastor who's right in the Lord. That's something you should fear. That's not good. Look at Jude 23. We live in a too much of an independent generation. Independent generation that lost its respect for elders, respect for the office that has an honorable position. We lost that nowadays. And we use the excuse of Joel Osteen and keep pointing him out to justify how we mistreat a pastor or the person God uses Amen. to show you Bible-believing truth. Now, why am I hard on this? Not because of myself. The people treat me right and treat me very well, which I thank God for. But I'm saying that because people who especially watch me online and they go to other Bible-believing churches, you just bring a bad testimony. Don't say, please don't mention our church or that you're a part of our ministry. Yeah. Go to Jude 23. Jude 23. People who are rebellious online and then go to other Bible-believing churches to give them a hard time and stuff like that, please, don't say that you're from our ministry. That's shameful. You have no fear of the Lord because you're so used to yourself making your own comment. And some of you putting that dislike and a nasty or negative comment right now. You have no fear. When the Lord, because I'm supposed to preach God's word, you have no fear of that? Look at Jude 23, Jude 23. All right, the next one, you know what Christians are scared of a lot? Themselves. You. You are a nightmare to yourself. Can I get an amen on that one? Yeah, if I don't get much of an amen, you don't know yourself. Yeah, come on. Until the Lord teaches you a lesson and humbles you, and you're down low, then you realize how really messed up you are, rotten you are, how scary you are, that you just want to be free from this. That's why there are people committing suicide. You know why suicide is high? They're scared of themselves. What they're feeling and thinking, it's tormenting them. They can't stand it. They want to be free. That's a nightmare is yourself. Look at Jude 23 if you don't believe me. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the what? See, they're so terrified of the corruption that their own flesh can do to them. Basically, it's your flesh. That's you. Look at Romans 7. Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. And we'll look at verse 14. Does this passage feel like you? What a horrible nightmare you're living in. Imagine a nightmare where 
you are double-minded, doing living two lives. A part of you wants to do this, but then another part of you wants to do this, and you live in that conflict. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then j just try having, you know, uh, two different wives with two different opinions during the Old Testament. No, I mean, you, you've seen women fight? You think you're going to please both of them, especially if they disagree with each other? See that in church, all right? So that's what you're living in right now. See, is the flesh versus the spirit. The spirit wants to do what's right. The flesh wants to do what's wrong. You're living in that two conflict. And you know what most of you are doing? You think you can please both of them. You think you can please two wives and everything will be all right. No, you're not. And you have no fear of your flesh, do you? No, 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 no. I can serve God and do evil. I can please both sides. You try that. Uh, how well is it working for you? Can I get a testimony report how well it's going for you guys? Praise report in our prayer request list. Look at Romans 7. Look at this nightmare at verse 14. This is a, this is a great verse for people who are struggling with sin, obviously, with their flesh, their weakness. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which is I, I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Ah, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I'm a prisoner trapped up in this wicked flesh. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me. See, there's a will in there. I want to do what's right. I want to, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. But I can't do it. I can't find it. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Isn't that how you feel? So people feel pathetic, guilty. That's why some people commit suicide too. If they're uh, addicts and then they're living in wrecked homes, a lot of them uh, take want to take away their own lives. There are sad cases of that. Why? Because I don't want to do this bad thing, but they still do it. They're a prisoner. Verse 20, Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law of my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity. Activity. See, you're, it's like a jail. It's like a prison. To the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's why people take away their lives. They can't stand it anymore. It's horrible. It's sad. Okay, uh, let's look at another passage. We'll go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians Chapter 7. We'll look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. All right, please keep your ears peeled on the sound and make sure that it's all working well, all right? Good. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Notice that the Bible says that you should clean up the sins of your flesh. Why? Because you're scared, and it relates to the holiness of God. See, that ties to God's presence. God's presence is so holy that people fear to sin. But when a lost person filled with sin goes in front of the holy presence of God, he's so terrified, he can't stand it. That's why. But this is going to build up more and more as we go through these verses, all right? You'll understand what I mean. Go to 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Why? Why should you clean up the filthiness of your flesh? Perfecting holiness in the what? Fear of God. You should be holy because you're afraid. You know why you should be afraid of yourself? Because verse 1 says, having therefore these promises. You know why you're scared of yourself? You're afraid you're going to miss out that crown of righteousness. Crown of glory, incorruptible crown, the gold, silver, precious stones. You're afraid of losing the reward of God's smile at you at the judgment. 
That's what scares you and terrifies you, Christian, the most. That's why you should be afraid. Why? The promises God has given to you. That should put the fear of God into you. How, how many of you can say God really blessed your life, right? Are you experiencing some blessings in your life? All right, then why aren't you afraid of God after that? After all the goodness God gave to you, you think you can abuse it and whine about it and find other problems in life? You should fear God. You know what God says at Romans 2? The more goodness he gives to you, if you don't repent, the more wrath builds up. You, you don't believe me? All right, keep your hand at 2 Corinthians 7. Let's go to Romans 2. You need this. You need this. Go to Romans 2. Go to Romans 2. All right, Romans 2. Romans chapter 2. When God gives you his goodness, that's to teach you to stay clean and right so you can fear him. But to abuse it and despise it, then God's, you're building up God's wrath on you more, his anger. Romans 2, 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to what? Repentance. But if you don't, verse 5, af but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath. How about that? against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. I told you so. It's building up God's wrath. Now, I know this passage applies to lost sinners, but do you honestly believe God's not thinking about a Christian, that God won't do this to a Christian, really? Because, verse 6, he's rendering every man according to their deeds. Okay, 2 Corinthians 7. Your hand's there, so I'll read it. Verse 11. Why should you fear messing up in your sin in your flesh? The Bible says, verse 11, For behold this selfsame thing that he sorrowed after a godly sort. So there's a repentance from their sins. And why? What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear. You're afraid. You're afraid of messing up. Are you afraid of messing up? Are you afraid of this wicked thing? If you're not, I am. People who get confident, they think they're right with the Lord, with lordship, salvation, I'm clean and I'm holy, they have the tendency to mess up. Higher chances of messing up then. All right, anyway, Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Philippians 2. How many of you are thankful for your salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Would you probably say that's the greatest, the number one blessing you have? Yeah, yeah. Then why don't you fear? When God gives you salvation, you're saved from hell. God expects you when you work out your life as a saved Christian that you should live in fear. That's real good, preacher. Why? Because he died on the cross for you and you're going to abuse that. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with what? Fear. fear and trembling. People mistakenly say you got to work in fear to get saved. No, that's not the idea. You get, how can you work out salvation if you never had salvation in you to begin with? See that? Because look at verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See that? You have to have salvation in you first. Why? So that you can have salvation. And then after you have salvation, God expects you to work it. Okay? You don't work to get salvation. No. You believe on Jesus Christ. You get salvation in you. But with that salvation in you, God expects you to do something with your life. Why should I be afraid? Because God's the one that gave you salvation and he's in you. And you don't fear God. Everything that you're doing, you're saying, you're watching, you're thinking, you're feeling, God's in you. That don't put the fear of God in you after, uh, look at Jesus' bloody face after he died on the cross and you try to commit your sin. <laughs> no fear. Romans 11, Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. And then we'll look at verse 19. Romans 11, verse 19. These proud, these proud fanatics, these proud so-and-sos who think that they're holy and right with God and uh, lordship salvation and 
you know, you got to repent of all sins out there. These high and mighty people, they should be afraid of themselves. You know why? Look at this. I'm the elect. God elected me. God called me. And oh, look at this. Romans 11:19. 19. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. God elected me. I'm in. And God cut them off. They're not as saved as I am. And verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and thou standest by faith. Be not high minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take ye lest he also not spare thee. How about that? You should be scared of yourself. When you're doing so well, and then you're like, oh, you know, and these people messed up. And, and No, you should be scared of yourself when you're doing well, too. You know why? That pride's going to get to you, and you're going to think, no, that temptation's not going to get to me. And then you're going to let, you're going to get into those temptation scenarios because you think you're too holy, you're not going to mess up. Yeah. Stay right there, preacher. Yeah. And then you get into a big, fat-footed mess. Yeah. All right, go to Hebrews 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Now, some people might take this passage to prove that, well, see, God can cut you off from your salvation. No, that's not the idea. The cutting off has to do with Jews and Gentiles. So then God's saying that the Jews have been put aside and God has focused on the Gentiles. If Jews want to get saved, they have to join the Gentiles program. But the Gentiles have become proud because... God bless America, this is America, in God we trust, and you see that? Yeah. And you notice that Gentile nations, they're going to hell right now. Yeah. You see that? So God's cutting them off, and he's going to go back to the Jews again. That's what he said at Romans 11. Right. How about that? All right, anyway, Hebrews chapter 12. But why did I use that verse? Because God has a tendency to do that with people. That's the bottom line. So that's why you should be afraid. Okay, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5. All right, number one. You ready for this? This is what Jesus even fears the most. You ready? All right, here we go. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, that's Jesus Christ, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he what? Feared, though he were a son. How about that? How about that? There was something Jesus was even afraid of. What is that? People think that it's the torture, the crucifixion of the cross. No, actually there was joy in that one. Look at Hebrews 12. What is this number one mystery? Well, let's look at it together, all right? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And then we'll read verse 2, verse 2, Hebrews 12, 2. Look, Jesus didn't fear the cross, the pain, the torture of it. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the what? Joy, Joy that was set before him endured the cross. Notice he wasn't scared of the, the shame. He was what? Despising the shame. He despised it. He put it aside. He didn't let it get to him and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, so the torture of the cross is not what put him to fear. But it says right here at Hebrews 5, 7 that we read, it relates to his death, right? There was something about his death that feared him. It's not the bloody torture and pain. Then what is it? Look at Matthew 27. Here's the key, Matthew 27. Remember, he was praying. That's what Hebrews 5 said, right? Hebrews 5 said he asked the father to take something away from him concerning his death. Huh. Let's look at exactly what Jesus prayed. Look at Matthew 27. Matthew 27. This is what Jesus feared the most, that he prayed for God to take it away. All right. Let's look at what God fears. Matthew 27, verse 38. Matthew uh, 26, excuse me, Matthew 26. I wrote uh, 27. That's my fault. It's 26, okay? And then we'll read verse 38. The Bible reads, notice what Jesus prayed here. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Okay, this relates to Hebrews 5. 
the strong crying and tears, right? At Hebrews 5. So there's something that's bugging him. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. It's a cup. Oh, that's the key there. He doesn't want this cup. What is this cup then? Look at Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah 25. The Bible will give you the answer of what the cup is. The nation of Israel, because of their wickedness and they displease the Lord, God says, I'm going to pour you out my cup of my anger and wrath. What is it? Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 14. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their what? Deeds. And according to the what? Works of their own hands. What these nations specifically did in their sins. God's going to pay it back. Look at verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of the fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad. It's God's cup of anger against sin. That's number one. Not your anger against sin, it's God's anger. It's at Hebrews, Matthew, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, gave up his righteousness and accepted your sin and we received his righteousness. In fact, Jesus Christ cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me. Why? Because of the bloody torture? No, because of the sin upon him. That's what he dreaded the most. What he dreaded the most was God's sin because of the separation that goes against his holiness. Now, do you see the dots connecting here why you should fear God because of his holiness? Why because of his holy presence people prefer to drop dead? In fact, Jesus Christ, he don't fear hell. He don't fear hell and all that kind of stuff. He faced hell. He got victory over hell. Yeah. But he feared this more. Yeah. You know what that means? That this thing, the sin thing, God's anger against sin, where his holiness is right, all bright, and where you're contradicting that, that's going to be the most scary thing ever in your whole life, more than bloody torture and hell itself. That's why it makes sense when you go to Philippians 3. Follow along with me. Philippians 3. Now think about it. Here is a lost person in his sin and in his iniquity, and he's standing before a holy, righteous God. Okay? Do you honestly think he's not going to be terrified of that? Of course he's going to be terrified of that. That's going to be the, the greatest nightmare in his whole life. How bad is it? Well, I'll tell you how bad is it. We're at Philippians 3, right? So keep your hand there. Go to Revelation 20, okay? Bear with me. Go to Revelation 20. How scary is it that all creation will run away? When God set up his white throne judgment, judging them for their sins from his holiness, creation cannot stand it and flees. Look at Re Revelation 20. You don't believe me? Look at Revelation 20. Verse 11. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven, what? Fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. That's your greatest nightmare. Is when God's holiness contradicts your sin, and the sin gets exposed to the light. And guess what? Darkness cannot stand light. And your darkness of your sin, when it goes to the brightness and light of God's holiness, you cannot stand it. You will scream. You will weep. You'll be glad that you, you get cast to hell. 
where the darkness is where you belong and sin is where you belong. Philippians 3.21. Philippians 3.21. So here's another thought, all right? This might be shocking to some of you. When God casts that damned soul to hell for eternity, believe it or not, that by, might be his merciful way of doing things so that they don't live up in a holy heaven with him because that's their greatest nightmare. You ever thought of that before? You ever thought of that before? Look at Philippians 3.21. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself? Okay, go to 2 Corinthians 5 now. Here's our last verse. We'll wrap it up here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We will wrap it up right here. 2 Corinthians 5. Okay, what did Philippians 3.21 say? We will have the body of Jesus Christ, correct? Now, that's a great news, right? We're so happy about that. But think about it. What did Jesus fear the most? Yeah, the cup. It related to the sin, right? Being judged by God's holiness. When you have the body of Jesus Christ, you're going to share that same fear. And that's why at the judgment seat of Christ, when God judges you for the bad that you've done in your body, it's going to be terrifying. Yeah, that's right, brother. That's the greatest nightmare to you is the judgment seat of Christ, not physical torture burning at the oh. stake for Jesus. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. If you don't believe me, let's look at the verse, okay? Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or what? Bad. bad. God's going to judge you, saved Christians, for the bad you've done in your body. Verse 11. Knowing therefore the what? Terror of the Lord. We what? Persuade men. That's how scary it is that Paul's trying to persuade the people that this is scary. You know why this video's out? I'm persuading you. Yeah. That's how terrified I am of God and these six things I'm trying to persuade you right now. If you're not saved in Jesus Christ, one, get saved. Yeah, amen. All right? Just go to our main YouTube channel. It'll show you how to get saved, the video in our main YouTube channel. If you are saved in Jesus Christ, get your act together. Start cleaning up your life, man. You got something to not look forward to, okay? All right, let's close with a word of prayer with that terrifying thought. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers, made us learn about real fear, real horror, and a nightmare. Uh, people don't understand what true fear is. I pray that from this teaching they'll understand it, that they will be scared, that they will be afraid, but not to the paranoid point where they're not able to live their life successfully for you, but rather the fear where it's enough where they can get their act together, clean up their life, get saved, and for Christians to clean up their lives and start living well for you. A, a healthy fear, Lord. There is such a thing as a healthy fear. If we're, fear, if we're afraid of getting electrocuted, we're, we're going to be afraid of the electric fence and not touch it. We need that kind of healthy fear, Father, for you as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.